and welcome to another edition of North Carolina 4-H's Daily Spark. My name is Lori McBride and I'm an Area 4-H agent for the East Region. I would like to introduce you to the Aspire program and then share some tips for how you can become more confident taking the ACT. Today we'll be talking about the math test. But first, Aspire stands for ACT Supplemental Preparation in Rural Education. It was designed to bridge deficits in rural high school students' performance on the ACT college entrance exam and then increase the number of students pursuing higher education. By participating in an Aspire class, you will learn the latest tactics and strategies to improve your ACT score. The program is open to high school sophomores and juniors and includes 30 hours of course instruction where students learn the skills they need to tackle the ACT. Students also receive the Princeton Review ACT Study Manual, their Practice Question Manual, and access to four full-length practice exams with score analysis and breakdown. Some fun facts about the math test. The ACT math test gives you 60 minutes to answer 60 multiple choice questions. The questions will come in three flavors easy, medium, and hard. This corresponds to the now, later, and never questions we discussed last week. However, the ACT likes to mix it up a bit, and this may not be totally true on every test. You may find what we like to call an Easter egg or an easier question in the last 20, but by and large, this will be the case. So what kinds of math questions are we talking about? Well, there'll be those that they call integrating essential skills, roughly 25 or so. This is what the ACT calls the math that you learned before high school, including percentages, ratios, proportions, and much of geometry. Then there's also those 15 or more questions that fall into the modeling category. And this is what the ACT calls word problems questions that make math out of situations. These questions are also counted in the above. So don't get bogged down on long or difficult questions. Bank as many points as you can on easy and medium questions before spending time on the tougher ones. Use your personal order of difficulty and do those first, then the later ones that are probably harder. And finally, unless you are shooting for a score over 30, there are some questions that you'll probably never work, so you'll just choose a letter of the day and move on. Remember, you only get points for correct answers, and there's not a penalty for wrong answers. Let's look at the pacing on the math test. If you look at this chart, how many correct answers will give you a score of 21? If you said 33 to 34, you're right. Now, look at the chart again. How many more correct answers would give you a score of 24? Only six or seven. Do you think that you could find five or six or even seven careless errors to fix? Most people who really stop to think about how to get a better score on the ACT and on specific parts of it, I always say they could find five to six careless errors to fix. Most of the time, they say if they hadn't left anything blank, they probably could have gotten a better score. The key here is to know what kind of score range you need to get in the college of your choice and then figure out the best way to get it. Meaning, if you know you need an average of a 27 composite score on your ACT and you're really good at math, then you should be shooting for a higher score in math and therefore pulling up other subjects that may not be your best to get to that average that you need. So slow down. Accuracy is more important than how fast you finish. And besides, the ACT was not written to be finished. Work your personal order of difficulty and then letter the day on those that are just too difficult to figure out in the given time. April Dillon talked about some strategies for improving your score in a previous video. 
but I wanted to review a couple of those and add a few more comments to them. The first one would be ballparking. When you look at figures on the ACT, the figures and diagrams that they give you are roughly drawn to scale, so you can trust your eyes when you're working on problems like these. That's very beneficial when you're trying to determine where these problems fit in in your personal order of difficulty and also using Poe to get rid of answer choices that could not possibly be correct. She also talked about plugging in, the basic approach. Identify the opportunity to plug in, choose numbers for variables, use your numbers to solve the problem and circle your target answer. And then you check all five answers and eliminate any that don't equal your target answer. This whole process changes algebra and geometry problems into simple arithmetic. If you have variables in the answers, plug in. She also talked about plugging in the answers, or PETA. You identify the opportunity to PETA, underline what the question is asking, and label your answer choices with what the question is asking. Start with the middle answer choice and work through all steps of the problem. When you find an answer that works, stop. Circle that answer, fill in your bubble, and move on. So how do you spot plugging in and plugging in the answers? So with plugging in, variables are in the answer choices. Variables are defined in relation to one another in a question non-specified numbers in relation to one another, such as ratios or percents. All of that is shown here in this question. To spot plugging in the answers, you're gonna feel the urge to set up an algebraic equation. The question asks for a specific amount or value, or if there's numbers in the answer choices, you know you can plug in the answers. Another example is listed here, number 24. So, is this question a plugging in or a plugging in the answers question? If you said it was plugging in, you're correct. And how do you know? Well, they give you non specified numbers or percents. That's what your answer choices are. Look at this one. Do you think this is plugging in or plugging in the answers? If you said plugging in the answers, you're correct. And you know that because the question asks for a specific value. And you should also have had an urge to set up an algebraic equation. So on the math test, some other things to think about and remember. Make sure you know the vocabulary and the rules. Go back to your exponents. Reread your rules. Make sure you know what a real number is and what is not. Watch your negative signs. Use your calculator wisely. Remember these parentheses precautions. Negatives, fractions, square roots, and operations in the numerator and denominator. Also, write down any values given on the figure if they're not already there. Write down the formulas you need. Draw your own figure if there isn't one. And in word problems, make sure you know the question. Underline what the problem is asking you to find. Let the answers help and break it down into bite-sized pieces. Make sure to review and memorize formulas needed in math like slope or circumference of a circle and others. If a formula is given to you in a problem, it's important. Don't ignore that piece of information. Thank you for watching this edition of the 4-H Daily Spark. Join us Thursday as we review some of the ACT tips and strategies for the English test. If you would like more information about the Aspire program, you can contact Bianca Glaze, the NC State University Aspire Coordinator at bglaze at ncsu.edu, or myself, Lori McBride, 
Area 4-H agent for the East Region. Thanks, and I hope these tips and tricks help you aspire to a better ACT score.